Greetings. I am Tom Merle. On this week's episode, we talk do things that don't scale is the secret to scaling with Chris Tatias. Check it out. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Greetings, I am Tom Earl, and this is my year of depth. We know you could be anywhere, so the fact that you are here today sharing your greatest gifts, your time and energy means the world to me. I hope you know that in this moment you are valued, you are loved, and you are appreciated just as you are. As you can see, I am not alone. I have back by popular demand. I've gotten so many DMs. When are you bringing Krista back? When are you bringing Krista back? We're sick of seeing your face. We want Krista back. Krista Tyus is back in the building, y'all. How's it going, Krista? Hey, Tom. How are you? Thank good, you for good. having me back. Of course. Did you know that there was like this huge, dedicated, loyal following of people <laughs> who listen to my podcast that are like always asking, did you know this was happening? No, no. I had no idea. No idea. <laughs> So we are we are so appreciative and grateful. I know that you are super, super busy. And so it's just, you know, your generosity is so amazing. So thank you so much. Thank you. I enjoy being here and that definitely talking to you. I enjoy it. So thank you. Of course, of course. So for the folks who are like, what, what, what was this episode? Tomroll.com slash Krista, C-R-Y-S-T-A. That's where you can find the replay from the last one. I want to recommend if you haven't listened to it, why don't you go ahead, and hit pause, go listen to it, come back. It'll give you some nice context. So, but just as a little reminder, Chris Tatias is an online marketing consultant who helps service-based businesses get clients from social media, master sales without being salesy, and build multiple six-figure incomes. Krista, what is, what's been going on? You know, when we started talking last year, the part of your story that that just motivated and inspired so many people was how you shared with us how in less than one year you went from you know experiencing homelessness to being in an estate i think that was the word you used to describe it a huge <laughs> michigan mansion and uh people were just loving that so you know i think we interviewed and you were moving in in like three four days to to your house so i think you're in how's it how's it going how's life how's family Give us give us a little mini update what you've been up to this past year. Yeah, so it's been amazing. So when we spoke, it was like the end of 2019. We were going into 2020 and, you know, I had just signed my lease and we had our move in date. And so we got into the home It's beautiful. The kids absolutely loved loved it. And then COVID came and smacked everybody around in 2020. But it was okay because, you know, we were an online business. So we were thankful for that. And then we were able to actually pivot and help a lot of businesses pivot online and learn how to sell their business. So 2020 didn't, I think a lot of people initial plans for 2020 turned out to be a lot different than what they had initially planned. So, and, and we were really the same way. Like we had a whole trajectory on how we wanted that year to go. And then the pandemic happened and actually it was a bittersweet year, 2020. You know, I can relate to that. 2020 for my family was actually really, really awesome. And so we say that with empathy, with knowing it was such a hard year and so many people, you know, our, yeah. my daughter was born in 2020. So we just had this house full of so much love. So I, yeah. I think you said it well, it was, it was bittersweet. What, what is your, who do you serve just for folks who need the refresher? Who do you serve? Who are the primary folks that you do business with? Yeah. So the primary niche market that I help are tax and accounting professionals all around the world. So CPAs, bookkeepers, um, tax professionals, and row agents, tax attorneys, anyone in that space is kind of like my specialty. And so what did it look like the, you know, second week of March? everybody shut down. <laughs> I'm assuming tax season is still going on. So what, what did it look like for, for your niche? What was kind of some of the, the pressing needs that you found? Okay. I better jump into gear and help 
around what? What what was that? Yeah. So what happened was that a lot of businesses, you know, had to shut down because of COVID. And in return, a lot of my clients were negatively affected, right? So if they shut down their business, they didn't need their tax professional or their bookkeeper to do the bookkeeping because there were no books to be kept, right? And so it really kind of rattled me in a way that I was like, I need to find out a way how I can help my community pivot. You know, a lot of people look to me for advice and for, you know, mentorship. And I'm like, how can we turn this into a positive? And that was, I just had to sit there and actually think about this. Like, how can we be of service and of value during this time to not only help other business owners, but also help my clients stay in business, right? Generate revenue. And so we actually taught them a few strategies during the pandemic, how they can actually just be of service, um, be of help to people with navigating and educating them on their, you know, how to obtain PPP, EIDL, really helping them help the businesses, you know, navigate during that time. Because a lot of business owners didn't know if they qualify for certain emergency assistance you know, how to qualify, what documentation they needed. So I was teaching my community simultaneously and they were going out and reaching out and helping. And so just in a few months, just by me teaching my community that they've helped tens of thousands of businesses all over the country, just navigate throughout the pandemic. So we were actually able to just help them just turn a negative situation into a positive situation. They were not only able to be of service, but also generate some revenue during that time too for being of service. You know, it's so interesting when you talk about the the ripple effect, I saw it go both ways in your explanation. So businesses start going out of business. So they say, I'm not going to, you know, I'm going to have to fire my tax accountant who might be thinking, well, I can't afford coaching anymore because I got nobody to then teach. And then you, instead of <laughs> panicking, go, Hey, here's exactly how I can serve you. And therefore how you can serve your businesses and then how those businesses can therefore serve their, but it's like this amazing. I love how you just said the ripple effect in a positive way instead of it just, you know, keep on going this negative way. And so of course right. I got, I, I got to ask then, you know, how did you become the person where, you know, the buck stops here where it's, Hey, I'm, I'm feeling the pressure as a business owner, but instead of, you know, me going into panic mode, I am going to help and instead, you know, create a positive ripple. How did you, how did you do that? Can you talk to us at all about you, your mindset or where that comes from or how you made that happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's a really great question because at, at last episode, we talked about the law of polarity, right? Where there's a good, there's a bad. And so where there's a bad, there's a good. So whenever anything happens to me, I'm always thinking like, it, if there's a problem, then that means there's a solution to that problem. And we just have to figure it out. So when COVID happened, it was just like, oh, here's this problem. What is the solution that no one is looking at? What is a solution that some of my clients might not be able to see because they are in panic mode, because they are scared? You know, a lot of, it was a lot of uncertainty those first few months. And so for me, it was just like, stay rooted, stay grounded and know that what wh whatever problems arise, there's a perfect solution for it. We just have to be in tune. We have to be in alignment with it. So I just was, I was constantly listening and looking for the answers. Right. And so I would just tell everybody that like whenever, whenever there's a problem, just be present and look for an answer, be conscious for answers, be in tune for those answers and solutions to kind of reveal themselves to you. And that's just what happened naturally. Like it just revealed itself. It was just like, oh, a lot of business owners are really confused right now. Oh, a lot of business owners are not even going after PVP and EIDL because they don't even think that they qualify for it. How can we in turn educate our community, which are tax and accounting professionals to say, hey, you need to put on your superhero cape right now. Instead of you cowering in a corner somewhere, you know, scared, we need to put on our superhero capes and we need to actually go out and save people. And I think that core philosophy has, it, it's always rooted with me. Like I know whatever value I give and offer the world, I'm just going to get that in return. And so I teach my clients that like, listen, if you want to be rich, you want to make money, no matter what economy or you know, financial markets we're going into, whatever presidency we have, 
all you have to do is be of service, be of value to another person. And that's how you're actually going to get all of your wants and dreams brought to fruition, right? So it's like, be a value. How can we step our side of ourselves and say, how can we help someone right now? And, and in turn, help ourselves, right? So, yeah. You know, I'm curious, you can either talk about your own experience or somebody who's listening, you know, especially with what's going on. I think scarcity can just sink its claws into our, our brains or our ourselves. And then the self doubt and the wanting to get mine first. Cause a lot of what you're talking about is to give value first, right? And instead of it's right. like, no, I'm going to get mine first and usually it's someone else's expense. How do you, if it comes up in you or, you know, for people who are listening, how can they, you know, get some of this abundance magic that you're just like radiating that we're just like, yes, Krista, let me have some of that abundance magic. How do you, how do you cultivate that? Or if somebody's feeling like scarcity just got such a grip on them. What, what thoughts or reflections do you have for them? Yeah, I think even in my lowest points, it was just like, how can I give back? And if you think about it, if you're sad yourself, if you're feeling down about something, the best way to feel good about yourself is to go help somebody with something or to go volunteer somewhere, right. Or to do something for somebody else that puts a smile on their face. Like if you think about it, like that's what intrinsically drives us is that human connection is, is that intrinsic value of knowing that you've helped somebody. So I, I would say no matter what is going on with someone's internal situation or external situation that you can always typically change that by being of value, being of service. And so that mindset is, Krista, if you're going through some things or if you are unsure, it's like I get clarity through taking action and I take action by helping more people or just simply talking to people, right? Simply learning like what issues they're going through, what what are their pain points? Because that's when you actually start to learn and you can really be in alignment to those answers and solutions that are going to be slowly but surely revealing themselves. So I spent the last few years actually just listening to people, right? Just hearing them out. What pains and problems are they going through? What's their struggle points? And I'm constantly being intentional about that because I want to find out the solution for them. Like I'm solution oriented now. So much so to my detriment sometimes, Tom, because like people won't even be looking for solutions. And I'm like, well, tell me more about this. (laughs) Cause it's like, I want to solve everyone's problem. Right. And I got to like turn it off sometimes. But I think if people can get into that solution oriented state of mind, there's next to nothing that will come your way that you won't be able to figure out how to navigate and overcome. Yes. Look, we're only what, 10 minutes in already. The gems are here. (laughs) We could just cut it right here and it's going to be another popular episode. Appreciate you, Krista. (laughs) Right. Thank you. you know, what I love that you keep saying is listening. And mm-hmm. what I hear from that is relationships that you have to stay having deep relationships with your community, with your customers, with your clients. So, you know, for someone and for folks, if you didn't listen to the last episode, you know, every month, Krista just keeps being her, her community keeps getting bigger and bigger, which I'm assuming also means more moving parts. Right. So how do you, when there's more moving parts, there's more customers, now you're scaling. How do you stay, you know, relationship based, listening based, even at scale, even when there's so much coming on your plate? How are you able to to make that happen? Mm, so one of the things that I have written down as like a core principle of mine and sidebar, if you haven't, if you are a business owner and you haven't written down like your core principles for your business, you need to do so like your mission, your vision, you need to be really clear on the type of business you want to operate and be able, even right now, if you just feel like it's just you yourself, it, it, that's it. And your cat and dog, right? You want to be clear on your mission, your vision and the core principles Um, And so one of my core principles is do things that don't scale. And what that means is talk to clients one on one, like I will hop on a call and people are so fascinated because they're like, oh my God, I can't believe you're hopping on the Zoom to help me with this problem. They think I'm like larger than life now. And it's like, no, one, one of the core philosophies is do things that don't scale because 
that's where you learn. You learn by like, I can't talk to every single client, but if I take the time out to talk to as many as possible, I'm going to get greater insight into the products that I need to build, into the services that I need to offer, into the customer support I need to put into place. So I always take that kind of like that above and beyond approach. And another phrase that I use is short term pain for long term gain. Like I'm always putting myself into situations where it's not scalable, but that's where you learn the most about your client, your customer, the services, the products that you need to offer that in turn is going to help you scale in the long run. Man, another moment of synchronicity. <laughs> Last episode, we, we there's a synchronicity where I was just doing this, my perfect day exercise. And you were talking about your perfect morning exercise. And I was just doing a writing exercise on how to scale the unscalable. So like, I, you're just, this is like blow my mind. So <laughs> I'm, I'm going to selfishly have us jump into this for a minute here because this is okay. the question I've been obsessed with, right? So the bigger you get, I think you, you, you keep the magic by keeping those unscalable things. So anywhere you would kind of want to jump in there, first of all, why does it matter to you, you know, to do that? Instead of saying, well, let me just water it down a little bit so I can make a little more money. <laughs> you know what I mean? Get a little more of my time where you're still saying, yeah. no, I'm going to jump on and give you, no, it's me, Crystal live right here. One, how come for you that is, that is a value? Let's start there. Yeah, because when you do hop one-on-one with your client, like that's like, front row seat to their mindset, to their wants, their desires. And the closer I can get to that, the better I know I can build products and services to support them in the long run. So each one-on-one -on -one call that I hop on, no matter how painful it is to do that, um, I'm actually in turn learning how we can actually make this product better to where like doing this short-term pain right now, we can scale to a million users, 2 million, 5 million, 50 million, 100 million, a billion users, right? Because we took the time out now to perfect the process. And perfection takes time. It takes a few years. People think that once they hit a certain level in their business, they're like, I don't talk to clients somewhere. I don't do my own calls. I don't, you know, it's like, no, I do my calls because that's where I learn how to create better products and services because I know I'm playing the long game. I know if I put in the short term work right now to and even short term might be three years, it might be five years, it might be 10 years. Right. I don't care. But all I know is long term strategy is how can we get as close to perfection with our products and services? And perfection means like whatever their ideals are, like like if someone could just and lose weight, then that's perfection, right? So how can we move forward to getting as close as possible to this perfect product or service that our clients, we're just taking a away a lot of the complexity for them? How can we make it easier for them? How can we get them results faster? And the only way that you're going to be able to really do that is if you do things that don't scale, you talk to them one-on-one -on -one and you hop on when they're having that pain and problem, like right when they're having it, so you can experience it live and help them trouble shoot that's that way I'm constantly putting myself in like the customer's state of mind and their position and now with that vantage point as a business owner you're dangerous because you you can see where the gaps and the inefficiencies are in the marketplace and then now you can create those solutions and reap benefits once they actually start to scale <laughs> down the line once they actually start to scale so for me it's just a long-term play time like I'm like I know I'm in this for the long run and I know I want to create perfect products as close to perfection for my clients as we can. And the only way that we're going to be able to do that is if we talk to them now and we're in their face and we know what their pains and problems are. It makes you dangerous to your competitors, y'all. Dangerous. dangerous. <laughs> I like that. That's got to be the name of something becoming dangerous to your competitors. That's good yeah. copy right there. <laughs> Yes. yes, yes, it is. It is. <laughs> I'll click on it. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all, I am selfish. I need you to know that, that I am selfish. And the reason Krista is here, because you are one of my favorite entrepreneurs and this long game you have in mind when you're like, uh, you know, everybody, all, I remember the year where all of a sudden everybody was like, Gary V, Gary V, Gary V, Gary V. It happened like this one year. I don't know if you noticed that. And like, I'm not saying you're not already niche famous, 
but I, I envision one year where it's gonna be like out of everybody's mouth, it's gonna be like, Krista, Krista, Krista. And I'm gonna be like, mm-hmm. well, I have a podcast you should listen to. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. So I'm, I'm curious about this. How often do you, you know, that this, this is what you're talking about now. So I'm, you know, scaling the unscalable. So I'm going to do one-on-one calls because I'm going to know this. It's going to make me dangerous to my competitors, that kind of stuff. Is that something that you just kind of intuitively just start doing? Or, you know, do you have a process for like, let me sit down, let me write down, or let me go for a walk and think about this. Can you tell me a little bit about the, you know, personal development, business development process that you you do to be as intentional and strategic and dangerous as you are. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I do. I love to follow people that I aspire to be like. And so I learn a lot from reading a lot of books by different billionaires, right? Ray Dalio, um, Jeff Bezos hasn't written a book yet, but he's had a lot of books written about him and his mindset and his thinking. And, and so I know the bigger long-term goal of where I want to go. So I just follow people that are living that and being that. And that helps me to understand what I need to be focused on now. Um, a lot of the people that I do follow, like Jeff Bezos, like it, the, the success that he has now, he always says is it, it's not from 2020 where the pandemic might've helped him a hundred extra 137 billion in assets. He, a revenue he's, he's gained that year last year, but he set that foundation several years ago, right? Like he set those foundations, those processes, those systems to even be able to benefit in 2020 with that business model during the pandemic. So it's like knowing that, knowing that a lot of the people that I aspire to be like, they they always think long term. They yes, short term, you know, revenue and cash flow definitely matters, but they're always looking at, well, what could this be 5 years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. And I think a lot of people don't look at it like that. Like they're so short in and now with their business I'm already 10 years, 15 years out, and I'm thinking about, well, what are the products and services that are going to be needed then? How can I start working on those today? So that's what kind of keeps me grounded. And I'm constantly listening to my consumers. I'm listening to my clients so I can have like that long term dangerous strategy of creating products today that are going to be wildly profitable and successful 10 years from now, 15 years from now. So I, I'm hearing you and I'm with you. And for one, you're a genius. So there's like a, there is a skill thing to this, right? There is an innate skill and level of genius you have for business. Yes. Okay. We're not going to downplay that. And lots of people are reading these books or listening to these podcasts, but here's the difference. People who have heard someone say, um, you know, you should know the values of your company. You should know your mission, all these kind of things. The difference is, you have you have taken the time to actually write it down. And like, you know it so well, you can recall it in an, in an interview and then have Tom Merle ask you 7 million follow-up questions on it. What, what, what is it that in your mind you tell yourself? Because you're super busy. Like we're going to get into it here in a sec. Like Krista runs a super busy company, <laughs> probably more busy than a lot of us. And yet you find the time to actually, you know, do those things, those things that might not give you the ROI now, they give you the ROI many years from now. How do you create the discipline and the structure to invest in things that aren't going to give you that ROI for for many years? Ooh, you have to be passionate about it. You have to be passionate because it's like, why else? Would you do it like if literally if most people just did this for money, they would have quit a long time ago or they will quit once they obtain a certain level of success because it's like, why push through? You know, once you got the fancy house, the fancy car, you got multi six figures in a bank. It's like, okay, well, now you're comfortable. What is that intrinsic value that keeps you persevering even past the state of you being comfortable, you and your family. And it's just sheer passion, right? Like I'm seriously passionate about my long-term vision. I'm seriously passionate about um, just building 
a long-term sustainable business that can be passed down for generations. I'm seriously passionate about like helping billions of people and I'm constantly like daydreaming on what that would feel like. What what would that look like? What product is that? What service is that? Like it is it's just a fire of just like I cannot wait <laughs> until you know, we're impacting billions of lives around the world. And so you have to have like that greater passion to keep you persevering because it's going to get tough. It's going to get rough. Um, And then you're going to get success. And most people, they, they look up and they have all, all the material things, but they still wonder why they aren't as happy as they could be. And it's just like, you just have to tap, tap into what you're truly passionate about. Um, if your business was stripped away, if if everything was stripped away, who are you and what do you stand for? And when someone brought that to me, it was like a complete eye opener. It was just like, holy crap, like, who am I without this thing, without Facebook or YouTube or, you know, if everything was stripped away, like, what do I stand for? Why am I here? And that's where I got like super dialed in on my long-term vision and my intensity, my passion just actually increased from there because I was just like, holy crap, now I know my bigger purpose in life. That blows my mind because a lot of us are doing, you know, what Brene Brown calls hustling for our worthiness, where we want to make a million dollars so that we can prove to all those people that we are worthy. So your mm-hmm. questions blow my mind because if I was to strip away all of that stuff, you know, who am I really? Where did you where do you find the courage to to answer that? I mean to do that, to strip away all the things that we're doing yeah. to prove ourselves, you know what I mean? And just be like, all oh, that's gone. Who are you really? Where does that <laughs> that courage or capacity to hold space for that kind of a question? Where do you think that that comes from? Or, you know, for folks who are like, I don't know if I can do that. What are your What are your thoughts for them? Mm, I think anyone can do it as long as they are willing to dig deep. You just have to dig deep and to really say, okay, once I got the fancy car, the you know the house, then what? Right? Like, ask yourself, then what? What, what, Earl, I mean, Tom, what if someone actually offers you a billion dollars right now to buy out your company? Then what, what would you do? Who, who are you? What, what would, what would, what would your next step be? Right. A lot of people, we get so attached to our jobs. You know how people always say, well, as a, as a CPA or as a digital marketer, like they always are like claiming the thing that they do as themselves. And it's like, no, you're, you're just a human being. So who are you? What do you stand for? And if everything was gone, what would you do with your life? Like if you would, if you didn't get paid for it, what would you do? Right. And and that's where you're going to start getting closer and closer to realize that, Hey, if I wasn't getting paid to do what I'm doing right now, I would still do it (laughs) because I genuinely love to do it. I literally work 12, 15 hours a day. Like aesthetically like I'm excited to work to other 15 hours a day and it it's like rarely am I thinking about the money it's just like holy crap the impact and holy crap like the world and it, it's it's always bigger, right? So I'm not saying you have to have like world domination views, <laughs> right? You just want to have like what and who are you and what do you stand for and when you leave this earth like what do you want to be remembered by? You are, you have, you are so good at asking questions. I think that's why you're such a good listener because you have such good questions. It's like, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you, you gave me a gift with one of your questions. The aha for me was where you said, you know, if somebody gave you a billion dollars for your company, what then? And this sounds crazy, but I would feel robbed because I want to like, I want to, I would feel robbed of the process. Right. If somebody today said, let me have a billion dollars for your company, humbly is my company's not worth a billion dollars right now. You know, I want to <laughs> get to, to that point, but I want to experience the transformation along the way. And it'd be like that. That's what I'd feel robbed from is the process. So I think for mm-hmm. me, that is what I'm addicted to is that process up. I can make it a little better. I can make it a little better. You know what I mean? Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're a builder. You you love the idea of building something. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Boom. Jeez. 
You are uh, an aha machine. That's I think that's one of your superpowers. I think that's I could be wrong. I think that's why people like being in your community, not just for the tangible money making things, but the ahas that they get personally along the way. What are your thoughts? Thank you, Thank you Tom. I, oh. I, I, I receive that. I receive it. <laughs> <laughs> I receive it. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So tell us about, you You had told me before we, we hit record that you got a new, really exciting venture underway. What's going on? Tell us about it. Oh, yeah. So we just launched um, our tech company in January. We spent all of 2020 building out software applications for the tax and accounting space. And we just launched it in January. So I'm, I'm really excited to be in this next like evolution of my business and of my life <laughs> right now. And w- what goes, I mean, to me, that just sounds like the the last thing in the world I want to do would be able to create a tech as a as this as the product right sounds like such a headache. Tell me about the you know some of the the behind the scenes. Like I just think even trying to create the software and the bugs and the tell me a little bit about the the any of the process that you can share with us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So someone who's not not technical, like I don't know how to personally code, you know, it, it definitely has been a learning curve this past year. And so just finding, you know, software developers I can trust was a process. You know, I definitely uh, was burned <laughs> a few times. I uh, went through several thousand dollars that just wasted, but it was a learning experience. And so, but going through that process, I'm kind of like you, Tom, where I'm a, I love to build stuff. Like I love the process of building and, and learning and growing from it. Just that going through that all last year was so fascinating, like creating wireframes. And I even actually started taking coding classes on codeacademy.com. Um, you know, going through and actually learning the behind the scenes on how certain features work, how the back end processes function, frameworks, all this other great techno babble is what they call it, um, was very fascinating, was very fascinating. And it was exciting knowing that I was actually creating something that people could use to help them solve their current problems. And that's where it stemmed from. Like after, you know, consulting in this space for a few years and literally no hyperbole, I've literally spoken to thousands of people in the past couple of years, understanding that they still had issues with onboarding clients virtually and, you know, running their virtual practice management. Like this is all new, really, that we're stepping into over these past couple of years. And especially 2020, really, propelled us and pushed a lot of service-based businesses to become virtual if they already weren't dabbling in it before. And so it just happened to be just the right time. Like I, I, I was already creating these software applications before COVID hit. <laughs> and so it was just like, oh yeah, we're definitely on the right track. Like we're definitely going in the right direction right now. And so, yeah, so we took that entire last year, 2020, to build the tech out. Um, and launching it has been definitely a learning curve, right? Like you said, dealing with bugs and dealing with, you know, um, the user experience, user acceptance testing, beta testing, like all of this stuff has been literally 15 hour days. But I'm excited because it's like, again, short term pain for long term gain, do things that don't scale. I'm talking to my users every single day to see how we can make the products better, right? How how can we um, streamline the products and get people to, to where, again, to perfection, like this is the only system that they need to actually start, grow and scale their business, their tax and accounting firm. So that's been insightful and clients that if you, if they see that you're going above and beyond, they'll deal with the bugs for now. Cause they're like, oh, okay, well it, it's, it's buggy right now, but she's hopping on zoom with me and we're like working it out. Right. And they're giving me so much insight on the features that they want and the workflows that they want to see. And so it's exciting because we're literally building something from nothing right? That's amazing. And I always go back to everything big was one small. So I always remind myself those principles. <laughs> I had a bunch of, this is always what you do. I have a bunch of questions and then right at the end, you drop something in where I'm like, no, no, no. I got to ask about this first. <laughs> what, where do the, your, your one liners, what, how do you develop them? Do they just drop <laughs> into the space and you remember them? Like t- talk to me about that. <laughs> My daughter's excited too. I don't know if you can hear. Her. She's like, no, yeah, I can't. Yes. ask that question. No. 
right. Um, no, I don't know. They just come to me. They just come to me. Um, they're a compilation of like sayings and quotes that I've seen over the years that just pop back into my mind. Like, oh yeah, that quote, it fits right very well right now. <laughs> I love it. Um, so, you know, my question was a little, I want to get a little nerdy here is, so how did you, how do you even find a developer? You know, when, and, and okay, let's start there. I'm not going to throw them all at you one time. How do you find a developer? <laughs> how do you go out and do that? Talk to us a little bit about that process. Yeah. So just job marketplaces. So indeed, um, Upwork, I just posted job postings to look for software developers online. So we've been, you know, I went through a lot of developers to get to a handful that can help me and build out the tech. So this could just be my own insecurity. You you might not have this problem at all. Um, but I, I know other people have had this too. It can be some like awkward when somebody sucks to be like, you suck. I'm done with you. <laughs> Did you? Cause that's what it was sounding like you, you spent money on some people and they weren't any good and you had to bless and release them. Did, did anything come up? Like, how do you like the mindset process of finding that perfect person? Is there anything, any insights you can offer that you either gained where you're like, it's like self-awareness, like, oh, I didn't know this about myself or, oh, this is a lesson learned. If y'all were to do this again, is there anything like that that you can share with us? Um, let's see. So, uh, I have so many lessons from just going through this process and a lot of stuff that I learned about myself, just how to be a better CEO, how to manage people better, how to communicate better. Like it, it has all been a very learning experience, but I would say one of the things that I probably wish I would have known before was just to take my time. I was in a rush, you know, like I, I was in a rush because I was excited and I'm like, you know, um, I, and I tend to give people the benefit of the doubt, like, oh, Tom sounds like, you know, or such and such sounds like they can do. Let's just go with them. Right. And I think now I'm very slow to hire now. It's very slow. So now it's like we got to go through three or four or five interviews. We got to do a test <laughs> because it's like the, the quality of the product can't be compromised because we hired fast or we didn't properly plan. And that's, I, I, I literally, I probably burned tens of thousands of dollars last year be, just by not properly planning and by executing too fast before we had proper plans and by not hiring the right people for the right position. So all of that has been a learning experience. So now I take my time and I didn't understand why tech companies, I don't know if you've heard this before, but tech companies, they would say that they typically do like several interviews for software developers and for key like C-suite executives, right? I don't know if you heard that buzz out there in the internet streets, but it's not uncommon for like Google to put you through like five to six interviews with like five to six different key executives, including like the CEO. At one point they were doing their direct hires. Now I think they still might for certain hires. Um, and I would think like, man, that's a lot of work to go through just to hire. But after going through this past year, I see why they take so much time like learning this person right not only their skill sets but you know just that person's core values their work ethics you know how they view work life balance all those things culminate to the right person at the right time and even when you still do all that you still it's it's still it's still it's not a perfect formula but i think definitely hiring slower and having a plan and not moving so fast would be something that i would do over or a lesson learned. I appreciate that you you sharing with us those gems. I had a similar experience where we were hiring for a position and we had about 100 people apply, which is a lot to go through. So a part of the application process was we had, uh, it was sug strongly suggested that you watch the About Our Team video. And then in the About Our Team video, at like right towards the end, I say, I want to reward people who watch this. The password is, and I gave a password and I said, now make sure that you include this password on your resume or cover letter out of the a hundred people, only around 10 actually sent mm -hmm. us the password. So we didn't mm -hmm. read any resumes that didn't include the password. Mm -hmm. is, is there any like little things you found like questions or things you found that like, boom, cut through the clutter for you? 
Oh yeah, for sure. Same thing. Same thing. I, I, I will put on a job description to send us a, um, send us a overview and no more than three sentences on what you think, uh, how you can contribute to the company based upon our about us section, for instance, right? Kind of the same thing that you did. And surprisingly out of 300 people, like 25 actually read that and did it. And it's like, okay, like it just makes it a lot easier to disqualify. So I love putting in little things like that to just disqualify a lot of people, even though though a lot of people that were disqualified, they had the credentials, they had the skills and it's just like, but you know, how much of a good employee were you going to be if you couldn't follow directions or if you couldn't read through the instructions? Especially for a details job like coding. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Okay, so you're launched. How's that going? How do you promote? What's What do you see as the difference between the sales process for getting people to sign up for a software versus, you know, like a course or a coaching program? Hmm. So I am probably not a normal like tech founder in a sense where most tech founders that I know and that I'm currently meeting, they are trying to raise capital. They're trying to raise, you know, funding from investors. They're trying to get to understand their problem, the the customer's problems and like learn more about their customers. Right. And so I've been able to benefit by having kind of almost an unfair advantage because I've been actually consulting in the space for two years. I've already have an email list of already over 15,000 people. I already have a community of paid clients. So that trust me and that, you know, know that I'm only going to recommend quality products and services to them. So the initial launch has been amazing. And we only launched it to our, to a very small, like, group of people just to make sure it's tested first to get through the debugging and all of that good stuff. So that has been amazing. And so it, there's no difference on how I sell it. Like I still use content. I still talk about the problems that this thing is solving, just like I would a course, right? What What's the, you know, the problem that you're helping to solve? What solutions are you going to help people achieve? And then just kind of really demoing it to them. And I think it's honestly, it's been, I don't know, it's been a little bit easier, I think, to actually sell software than it is a course because they can actually go in there and test drive it, right? You give people a free trial period. They go in, they can see for themselves, like, is this something that's going to be beneficial for me and my business? I love that. I love that. You know, as we're as we're getting ready to wrap up here, there's a couple more questions. One that comes to mind is my wife has this phrase, this this ethos that she believes in. I think it's going to resonate with you. She always says that your community is your wealth, and your wealth is your community. Mm. And I feel like that is the way you have built up your business is through investing in relationships. Am I am I missing the mark? Oh yeah, for sure. And I didn't even, I wouldn't have never looked at it like that until last year, like the, that I have built up relationships and I didn't even look at it that way. So yeah, you definitely hit the nail on the head. So what, what would be your advice for somebody right now who is out there DMing 300 people where they're like, I don't usually pitch people, but mm-hmm. da, 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 you know, where it's like, they're going right for the immediate sale rather than building the relationship first. What's, what would be your, your, reflections or, you know, let's sit down for a sec and, and listen to the Krista moment. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And and I tell people this all the time. I'm like, the old way was always be closing, right? ABC. And I'm like, I changed it to the new way, which is always be connecting. And I think if you build genuine connections with people, you don't have to be salesy. You don't have to sell them. You don't have to shove down your course, your product, your service. Like when you genuinely show up and you are always connecting with someone, building that genuine connection, sales becomes so easy and graceful and it actually feels good, right? You're like, yes, we're sales. But it's like, it feels good for you and the other person. So I would just say the old way is gone now, guys, right? We need to get out of the the closing atmosphere and really step into this new age of connections, of value, and of really being of service. And that's where once you make that shift, sales and success comes like with ease. 
are you still using or do you still advocate for using LinkedIn to start a conversation, then book a call, talk with folks on the call? Do you still advocate for that or are you doing something different? Is that no longer working as well? Yeah. So no, that still works. So LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram is just the difference now is that we genuinely build a connection first. So I don't know if I explained that on the first session on our first interview, but that's exactly how we do it. We genuinely build a connection with this person. Then we let them know how we can help, what problems we solve. And that naturally flows into a strategy session. And I'm, I'm assuming you do that through the the awesome questions that you have, asking them some questions and, and listening. Is that what I'm, am I guessing right? Asking them some questions and listening. And then also a little like sales psychology too in there, right? Because people like to do business with people subconsciously that they know, like, and trust or that are similar to them. So how can you immediately build up that connection within the first 10 seconds where this person subconsciously feels like, man, me and Krista has, have a lot in common, like, man, she's cool. And they kind of let their guard down because you did take that time out to build up that connection first. Then you go into actually, you know, building the, the, the strategy, right. Of like explaining what you do and then easily transitioning them into a connection call. Any, any tangible examples or suggestions for how you do that? Yeah. So for instance, if you, you just had a beautiful daughter, um, I would say, Oh my God, Tom, I looked at your page. Your daughter is absolutely gorgeous. Congratulations. I remember when my daughter was one years old, she was too cute, but she also, those terrible twos are coming up. So, um, be on the lookout. (laughs) Ha ha ha. Right. Like I will say something where subconsciously you don't know I'm doing this, but I'm building up a connection to show Tom, you and I are just alike. We have a lot in common. I have a daughter, you have a daughter, right? And I'm saying that within the first 10 seconds of the conversation. So our conversion rates of getting people on the phone has actually quadrupled because now we're actually going in and we're building those intentional connections for the consumer or our prospect to feel like, man, we have a lot in common, but they're subconsciously thinking that they don't even know that that was a thing, right? They're just like, oh, she's really cool. And we, she has a, a daughter too, honey, look, <laughs> right? And so making those genuine connections are game changer, game changer. What, what's the phrase you were saying? Uh, do the unscalable. Is that what the phrase is? Mm-hmm. Well, um, do things that don't scale. Do things that don't scale. Y'all, you cannot scale. You can't AI that opener, right? You can't AI. Tom, I saw your daughter. She's almost 11, right? And I think that's where people mess this game up because they're like, hey, and sometimes they even mess up the code. Hey, first name. You're like, mm, busted. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Hey, <laughs> no. I love that. That's so awesome. Yeah. Um, so Krista, if you could right now send a letter back to yourself one year ago, the last time we talked, 2019, December 2019, what would you want Krista December 2019 to know? Hmm. What would I want her to know? I would say, I would tell her that she's on the right track (laughs) to keep going. Don't stop. Keep going. And, and everything is everything that you're looking for is going to slowly be revealed to you in the perfect way at the perfect time. Now we got to go the other way. Krista. (laughs) billionaire tech mogul, however many years this is, right? <laughs> what is, what do you want to tell her? Oh, the future Krista, the, the, yep. like, like the billionaire, like you said, the tech mogul, yep. what do I want to tell her? Um, to remember your why and Tom, that is a really great question. Like that is like getting me choked up. <laughs> You know what? You're good. <laughs> you are good. Oh, that is such a great question. Whew. <laughs> I can't even talk right now. <laughs> Take your time. Take your time. We we can pause. We can edit. We can edit out the pause. Just you can just sit with it, or or we can move on if you want. I don't. Whatever you'd like. Mm-hmm. 
<laughs> I don't know why that was so intense just now. Um, so yeah, so future Krista just needs to remember your why. Um, and remember your purpose, your purpose on what you're doing and why you're doing it. <laughs> I cannot believe that that just overwhelmed me just now. Thank you, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> that question clearly overwhelmed me. But yes, re- remember your why and to remember your purpose. Mm, mm. And, and tell me, feel free to at any point to say, Tom, move the hell on. What, what, <laughs> what do you think it was? If you're willing to go there with us, what do you think it was that? Where do you think that hit or why or an, anything that you want to share? What was that? I think, um, I think because it's true, like, like there, there is billionaire Krista right now. It's just, we, I haven't caught up with her yet. Right. And so it's, it was surreal to just talk to my future self just now, because I know that that's already happened. It's already materialize it's just I'm not experiencing yet <laughs> so it, it was just a very surreal moment just to just have that moment like holy moly like billionaire tech you know the the philanthropist right like she's there she's there and so yeah I think that that's why I got emotional <laughs> that's awesome well, I I 100% believe in that vision. I see that vision. You're amazing, Krista. I, I want to thank you so much once again for yeah. being here with us today, for sharing your gifts, for your passion, for sharing your heart with us. Is there anything coming up that you want to speak to before we, we start to close out? Anything coming up? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, like in your heart, like, is there anything that you wanted to speak to that you're channeling that you wanted to give voice to before we, we start to close out? Oh, I would just say just, um, just gratitude, just like that has kind of been like my mantra for the past several weeks is just like be being grateful for what, whatever you have, wherever you are, like right now, like just always holding that constant space of gratitude, even when things seem bleak. I think that's that has been like a key pillar in my life is just gratitude, even in my darkest moments. So that's what I would just leave everybody with. <laughs> Stay in a constant state of gratitude. I love that. So Krista, for the folks out there who want to DM you, who want to email you or whatever way they w- that you want them to get in contact with you so they can say, I appreciate you so much. And here's my money. What is the <laughs> way, where can they reach out? How can they get in touch with you? Yeah. So Instagram, I'm on Instagram at Krista Tyus. Um, you can send me an email. It's hello at Krista com. And yeah, follow me. If you have any questions, I'm always open and willing and ready to answer any questions that you guys might have. Show notes today, tomrell.com slash Krista T because tomrell.com slash Krista is the last interview. So that's <laughs> C-R-Y-S-T-A. T, Krista T.com. Krista, thank you so, so, so much. I appreciate you. I am looking no. I am looking forward to Tech Billionaire Krista. <laughs> Somebody finding this clip and DMing it to you and you getting to look back and be like, I remember that moment where we saw each other. Yes. I, there's like a time capsule. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Yes. So thank you so much, Tom. I really appreciate you. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. So our closing ritual is for you to share uh, with those who are listening an invitation. So what would you like to invite them to do, to be, to consider, to think about, to evolve into, to start practicing? What's your invitation? Oh, yeah. So I just said it with the gratitude. So gratitude would just be my invitation. I invite all of the lens, all of the listeners right now after this episode ends to just sit there for 60 seconds and be mindful of everything that you have and everything that you are, whether you know, family, friends, your health, just being right, just being and filling your heart right now, just 
feeling yourself breathe, just being in that constant state of gratitude for life. That's what I will leave everybody with today. And I suggest if you're cool with this, why don't we give people 15 seconds right now? We're just going to just pause for 15 seconds and we're going to have y'all think of something you're grateful for. So go ahead. And I invite you all, if you're someplace that you can, to pause and write it down. And after you write it down, to say it out loud. Or if you're driving or if you're somewhere you can't do that, I want you inside your head to picture yourself saying it out loud. And so we invite you to continue these 60 seconds. But in the meantime, I will say, Krista, thank you so very much. My gratitude's easy. I'm grateful for you and for your the generosity of your time and your spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. And to all of you who are listening or watching, as always, I'm wishing you peace and blessings. Thank you. Oh, oh one, one more thing. I'd love to continue the conversation. Feel free to join me at tomroll.com slash join. Subscribe below or let's connect on social media. Tom Earl Artist. Thanks again for watching. Yay.